So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Aromal. I'm the product manager for uh, Netflix Auditor from Bulwark Technologies. And uh, along with me, my uh, technical engineer from Netflix, Mr. Dave Matthews also joined. And today, uh, we are actually giving a small webinar, you know, awareness section for the working from home scenario and how the insider threats and cyber criminals are happening on the cybersecurity side and how as a Netflix as a solution will address on each, you know, concerns and challenges. So, uh, I, first of all, I just thank you for all the, you know, attendees who was actually, uh, you know, presented in the, on the, your valuable time today. So just moving into the details and into the session of uh, in the inside the threads, so just having the words that how the session actually planned. So we will have a basic introduction about the work partnership and uh, basic introduction about the Netflix as a you know, organization, and also we will address some kind of you know challenges and the risk how on uh, and how that you know the common challenges and risk have happened on the. Uh, remote working scenario and how actually the Netflix will respond and each concerns have been organization is facing and uh, Mr. Dave will also, uh, you know, hand over, a, uh, you know, will present a small demonstration about the product and we have a dedicated, you know, Q&A session for you can actually, uh, you can clear your uh, different queries and different kind of, you know, technical doubts on the particular solution. Just moving into the, you know, next part, like uh, I will give a small introduction about my company. So, Bulwark as a company, uh, we are one of the award-winning specialized cybersecurity value distributor in the region, and we are started our operation in 1999, and we are almost terminated our 17th year in cybersecurity excellence in this region, and we are privately held and profitable since the first year, and also we are representing. Uh, 22 plus different technology vendors uh, in the cybersecurity portfolio. And we are operating in GCC countries, uh, different GCC countries and India as well. Uh, in terms of the partnership, we have around 500 plus partners across the different uh, you know, GCC region. And for particularly for the Netflix, we have a successful partnership for the more than uh, many years. And for Netflix, we have a dedicated sales, marketing, and technical team to support different customers, different partners as well. And we have a dedicated, you know, technical certified engineers also who is actually taking care of the different kind of demonstration and different kind of, you know, uh, testing the solution and also supporting on the, uh, you know, installation and configurations. So moving into the next part, I think uh, Dave can better explain about uh, Netflix. So I'm just uh, hand over to Dave. Please, Dave. Thanks very much, Romo. Brilliant. Right. So thanks everyone again for joining, for taking the time out to to spend some time with us. Um, as Romo talked about earlier, we're talking about some of the challenges, the risks that are presented with this new scenario where we have the majority of our workforce working from home. And then I want to walk you through, um, you know, how both with internal process, you might be able to address some of those security concerns and also how where products like Netrix can help you as well to get a better grip on the security within your organization and make sure we're able to, um, we're able to secure our environments much better um, and sleep a bit easier at night as well. So, First up, the challenges uh, that we're facing. I guess the first thing is is to acknowledge, you know, we are in an unprecedented situation where we've had to shift very, very quickly from a standard office-based environment, um, you know, with a perhaps a mobile workforce uh, that's operating there to very much majority of a remote-based workforce. Um, the shift in this, the, these changes, which uh, for some of us have been in place now for three months, um, has meant that, you know, with the speed of this change, we've had to move to um, have our users working on perhaps devices that haven't been through proper security scrutinies. Uh, perhaps we've got some of our users that might be on unsecured personal devices. Um, we might also find that with the tools and the processes that we have in place, we're not able to accurately monitor um, and and uh, 
alert on internal behaviors you know on on day-to-day -day activities it's much different from when we had our users working in our secure environment um, what we've had to do as well to face this is um, you know in order to get everyone working much faster we've had to prioritize productivity we've had to do this shift without interrupting our cash flow without interrupting our daily business processes um, that might mean that we've had to prioritize you know these changes so we've had to move into cloud-based apps we've had to increase our VPN capacity um, and perhaps at the neglect of the some of the monitoring tools some of the um, you know the evaluation process that we might go for um, setting up some of these features as one example I can talk about my experience over the last three months is this huge uptake on Microsoft Teams um, and there's been this massive uptake it's been a very useful tool for a lot of organizations that had already invested considerably in Office 365 facilities, but perhaps there isn't a complete awareness of the sorts of vulnerabilities. You know, where is the data actually stored? Who really has access to it? Can this data be shared remotely with, uh, you know, non-business placed uh, users um, at the moment with the current security policies that you might have place? We've really had this prioritization, prioritization of productivity over security, which has also led to other areas too. Um, we've got some users that we've come across having local copies of very sensitive data. Um, perhaps they've been unmonitored in their activity and their access to that data. We may not have also been able to monitor the, um, the activities or the, the software implemented on the devices that they're using locally while they access and, and work with this data. The other issue we've had is around user threat. You know, um, internal users themselves, uh, while secure and safe in, and monitored within our office-based environments, when users are working from home, um, you know, there's been, people have been unsettled by these changes. Uh, they've seen the interruptions, they've seen the news. Um, and certainly, again, I've come across this where we've had redundancies within the industry, uh, where people see, you know, perhaps even colleagues have been furlonged or have been let go from an organization. So again, being unsettled, you might find that some people are taking extra steps. Maybe they're capturing customer info while they're working at home so that should they lose their job, at least they have something um, of value that they're able to take with them to uh, the next organization that might be able to employ them, which could very well be our competitors. So while we might have created uh, security gaps, you know, within our environment, um, you know, where we've traditionally been designed for a secure perimeter where everyone's accessing or has access to our data within the office. Um, as we've responded to this new way of working um, and less time to secure those environments and, and improve the, um, you know, improve our security and fix those gaps. Um, what we have seen at Netrix is we've seen quite an increase in attacks on our remote forces uh, as well. In fact, 30% is the number that we're seeing in terms of those attacks. Um, and according to a CNBC Technology Executive Council, 36% uh, of the executives uh, within, within that organization uh, had, had specified that 30% increase in attacks. When they describe the types of attacks, we're not talking about anything unique or new, neither. We're talking about traditional user-focused attacks. So these can be phishing attacks, attempts to gets users to, um, you know, to sign up for various newsletters, you know, health and safety when working from home, best security practices. I've seen these with the Netrix coming through through to my email. You know, these are external organization, external threat actors trying to get access to uh, my personal or my corporate information simply because my name is on, uh, you know, is on the front page of a couple of webinars that I've presented. But we become targeted vectors of attack. You might also see users who are leaving organizations. You know, again, we, we see this case with redundancies, with people moving roles or changing within their environment. All it takes is one update to LinkedIn to say you've left an organization and now attackers, again, have a targeted um, access point. You know, they're going to check and see, well, does that person's credentials still work for remote access? Uh, what sort of messages am I getting if I'm trying to remotely access or trying to log in? If I'm sniffing around, you know, who can I, or, or where can I target those attacks to get uh, back in? And we see with the hackers as well, you know, not only in the phishing attacks, we see traditional things like brute force um, attack vectors and, and similar there trying to, trying to make their way back into the environment. So 
there's a whole bunch of new risks that we're facing. Uh, you know, that, um, again, like I say, unprecedented times that we are, are in with our remote workforce. So we need to take steps now to ensure that we are you know, not pushing back our productivity, not holding it back, but we are enabling our work users to be able to continue to do their work, but they're able to do so securely. And there's several different steps that you can take, not only in implementing solutions, but also in internal practices and policy to ensure that you are security, uh, securing your environment. The first I definitely recommend is look at the use of authorized cloud apps. Um, so encouraging users to, um, uh, to, to pull data through, um, through the use of authorized applications, rather than having someone share data to an unauthorized personal Dropbox account or an unauthorized personal, uh, perhaps a, a uh, Google Drive account or something similar, let's have a look at options to enable OneDrive within your environment. Perhaps, as I said earlier, look at Microsoft Teams and implementing that solution to make it an, uh, an available resource for users to get access to the sensitive data that they need, that they can pull down a local copy within that secure environment, make the changes, and then of course it gets saved back into your infrastructure so it's going to be backed up, it's going to be monitored for access and tracked for activity and changes as well. Ensure that our users are keeping their devices up to date. So again, we make sure that users are maintaining their updates. Uh, you know, going back 20 years, we were talking about antivirus updates. Those updates are just as important now as they were back then as well. Uh, but this could also extend further from your desktops, your laptops and devices. We want to make sure that our servers are being maintained, that they are maintaining their updates, that any hot fixes that are deployed by Microsoft you know, on, on our patch uh, updates on, on those Tuesdays, we make sure that they are deployed appropriately because again, these are easy attack vectors. Also make sure that your users are encouraged to update their personal devices. Again, if they're using their mobile phones for checking emails and securing connections. Um, if they've used Outlook on their personal mobile device, then there's a good chance that they might have some uh, company information saved on their phone. Now that could be just the credentials to authenticate with, uh, with Outlook, with Office 365 or similar, but make sure that they are uh, encouraged to update and manage those devices um, to ensure that they are secure. So again, they don't become the weak spot in your security policy. And also enable secure VPN access. So make sure that not only are we protecting the data while it's at rest, whether it's local or remote, but also that while that data is in transit, that it is being secure. Again, I've come across uh, organizations where they've got users logging in, they're using their personal Wi-Fi. What they don't realize is they live in an apartment block where their Wi-Fi has been potentially compromised. It's been shared, it's been used by other users, or even as the shops and the uh, cafes start to reopen, we find users are, in, you know, they're encouraged to get out and about, maybe spend a little bit of time outside. So they're logging onto public networks. They're sitting in a park to do their work. And you find that, again, they're on a public Wi-Fi. It might be insecure. You might have, again, a threat actor sniffing for data that's been transferred back and forth there. If it's not secure, then uh, your data is definitely not secure. So making sure that you're using um, secure VPN access for any connections coming into your office and into your, uh, into your company data. Budget concerns, of course, as I said, we've had to reallocate budget perhaps to enable our remote workforces. We might also be reviewing our budget and what's going to be available because as a result of a pandemic, we're seeing a bit of a downturn in terms of you know, uh, revenue and, and cash flow streams. So making sure that we um, uh, take advantage of what we already have in place of what we can do without having to, to increase our spending um, you know, is, is going to earn you good points, uh, you know, with management within your organization. So leveraging what you already have, reviewing your policies um, and security guidelines uh, within your organization. Now, you might have certain policies that were work, uh, working and efficient and fine when the majority of your workforce was based within the office. Now you might need to go and review some of those policies around personal data being copied. Um, around where it's been stored, around how you share that personal information or that company information. Um, certainly, I've seen organizations where I've been talking to them about solutions and they've come to me and said, well, 
uh, Dave, you know, we need to we need to look at a solution that can uh, scan sensitive data on personal devices. You know, what what can be done to help us with this? My recommendation has always been you should not be storing company data on personal devices. You should not be storing company data on laptops that have potential to be stolen or um or or you know lost or damaged. Uh, if if you've got sensitive data, important data on those devices. If that device has not been backed up, it's not part of your um, in-office infrastructure and part of your, your main backup schemes and policies, then that data has always been at risk. So make sure that you're improving those policies. Make sure that you're redirecting company data to be stored on um, secure infrastructure within your organization. Um, and while we're talking about that data that's sitting on those remote devices, make sure that it is appropriately protected. Again, the number of organizations that don't have a strong password policy um, uh, you know, enabled and and set up is uh, is quite surprising to me. Um, this is because I deal with people on a regular basis. Um, you know, through through my roles when I've been working in support and enablement, I've come across quite a large number of users who um, they keep a very simple password policy in place. In one law firm I worked in Central London, we had uh, one of our high profile partners, so somebody whose name was on the front door when you walked through the building. And he was fed up with password policy, and so he just went with he went with a very simple policy. Was if you make me reset my password every month, that's fine. I'm just going to go with the month and the number of the month. So September 09, October 10, November 11, and it was a terrible policy for him to have, but it was how he managed to work around the company password policy. Um, that user himself had a lot of privileged access, and in fact, that organisation did have a breach several months after I left the organization. Nothing to do with me, I promise, but that is um, that is the risk that companies are exposing themselves to by not implementing very basic policies in terms of making sure that users are using appropriate uh, password complexity, that they're being cycled on a regular basis. And also, if you have the opportunity, take a look at multi-factor authentication. You know, take a look at advanced authentication methods to ensure that those passwords are, are safe and secure. Wherever possible, my experience is that users will reuse old passwords or that they'll keep it simple so that um, it's easy for them to get access. I'm sure there's a number of users within your organization that if they have the opportunity, they'll be using their Facebook or their LinkedIn or their Twitter passwords. And it's only a matter of time until, um, again, those passwords are fished or those accounts are compromised and then someone's got access to a universal password and your entire network is compromised because of that user's inattention to the um, to their password policies. And lastly, protecting your communication channels. So making sure that um, you follow the least privileged principle to um, protect your data within your organization. So protecting the data that can be shared both internally and externally. Like I said, Microsoft Teams, um, you'll be surprised how many organizations enabled this without realizing unauthenticated users, um, you know, that there was anonymous data sharing enabled, that users without an appropriate company login uh, were able to have this data shared with them. We just we just don't want that in today's environment. So make sure that you are uh, securing the channels, that any sensitive data that is being transferred to your customers, um, not only is it being sent through secure channels, but it's being sent through secure channels that can also be audited and monitored make sure that you can uh, you can see that handover of data so that should there be uh, should there be an incident or an issue you can understand the um, the data lifecycle you can see who had access to it what they were able to do with it when was it shared externally where did it go to we should also still continue to keep an eye on our own internal threats as well being able to understand um, our users' behavior and activities. So this is where being able to audit and establish baselines of normal behavior and activity comes in and is very important. Knowing who's accessing your data, what they're doing with it, how much data are they accessing on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, what sort of data do they have access to? Is there any sensitive information contained therein? If somebody's working in a sales role, obviously they'll have access to product information. But if they're not working in a role that also overlaps with a financial role, then why do they have access to uh, perhaps company reports around, uh, you know, around finances, around uh, regular intakes and similar there? 
if there's a reason for them to, um, or if, if there's not a reason rather, for them to have access to highly sensitive data, then that needs to be reviewed. And you need to be able to understand that. Um, and also, of course, being in IT, being in IT security, uh, you won't always have the answers neither. So being able to identify, well, who's the data owner? Who's the person I should be able to talk to? That's where that can come in very important as well. Once we understand our activities, once we're monitoring and we've established what's normal, we can then start to highlight what's abnormal, what's unusual. So by identifying spikes in activity, um, you know, anything that works outside of normal data access trends, we can then start to highlight um, those areas of concern. Uh, again, a major uh, requirement has been around monitoring for logins. Um, we've got customers who use Netrix to monitor for failed login attempts. You know, when we have uh, multiple failed login attempts, we might generate an alert that's going to apply a risk score to a user's profile. But that's no good if everyone's suddenly logging in from home and we've moved over to Office 365. So everyone's usernames changed in the format and how they access that. You might find you have a sudden spike in failed login attempts from all across your organization. But that means that your alerts now are just bad. They're bad data. They're not giving you the information that you need to. So by using Netrix, you can actually readjust those baselines very quickly so you can establish, okay, well, here's what's considered the new normal and here's how we establish what's a spike in activity, excessive failed login, um, uh, sorry, failed login attempts or similar there. Again, I'll take you through that in the demonstration to show you how you can highlight those areas of concern um, so that you can focus your efforts uh, when you detect an incident or a potential incident and an attack that might be happening. And last step is, of course, being able to prepare a response plan. So being able to establish a, a, a clear plan for if we do have an incident, what happens then? There's a notification that goes out, great. Who receives the notification? What happens if that person is not available, as in their phone has gone to sleep, it's maybe it's in do not disturb mode? How do we escalate those notifications up the board? Or if there is no notification, do we, do we actually have an active workflow that's going to lock down a data source to where an attack has potentially been breached. Um, this is this is something, again, I've had to deal with. I wish I've had proper response plans in place, particularly around areas such as malware. When somebody's accidentally released that within an environment, how are you able to stop that? How are you able to quickly recover and understand exactly what data has been affected by that attack um, and, and get things back up and running and working as quickly as possible? Very difficult position to be in. When you, uh, when, when you haven't been able to uh, make that plan ahead of time. <laughs> so we should also take those steps to secure our environment. So we need to, of course, make sure that we review our VPN access, make sure that we understand activity that's been shared, where our users logging in from, where's considered normal activity and behaviors. You know, if we have users that are logging in from um, you know, multiple destinations around the country, that's great. But if we suddenly detect a spike of activity coming from a country completely outside of a normal remit of, of where our users are accessing, well, in current today's current environment, not many people are traveling. So if we see these spikes in activity from multiple geographical locations, maybe we need to go and look into that. Maybe we need to understand that better. Or even for our own users who are working within our own environment, how much data are they normally transferring on a day-to-day -day basis? If someone goes from one gigabyte of data up to 20 gigabytes of data in a single day, make sure that you are able to be alerted and that you're aware of that transfer, because this could be somebody who's planning to leave your organization. Maybe they're making copies of customer data to take with them, or even taking copies of your price books or similar there. Make sure you regularly review those password policies. Like I said earlier, you can have organizations where we have a password and policy implemented uh, and, and working away. There are multiple scripts now that you can go and set up to run within your environment to test the passwords that are, are in place. Um, I've got several links that are, that are highlighted in my own bookmarks where I can download these scripts to test and see if someone's using a common password within my environment, I want to know about it. I want to be able to go and have a chat with that user around data security and make sure that they are implementing appropriate uh, protections around their environment. Uh, make sure that you're following that least privileged access model so that users have access to the data that they need access to, not just that they have access to everything. 
because that's the easy way to do it. If any user account is compromised within our environment and that user account has access to sensitive data, then everybody is at risk. And also, of course, ensure that you've got appropriate backups and, and systems in place. I mean, that's a given. It's It's been there since I started IT 20 years ago. But again, how many times have we gone out recently and tested those backups to make sure, you know, if we do have a, a shutdown um, uh, or if we have some data compromise, how quickly can we get that back? And just to give you a little story about that, uh, it wasn't a pandemic, it was an earthquake. I was involved in a, a very significant uh, event in New Zealand back about 10 years ago. Um, and I was working in IT as an, with an MSP. So I looked after a number of small and medium offices. One of those offices was flooded as a result of an earthquake. Um, and while a lot of users and workers began working from home, they were picking up their data from their damaged office buildings and moving to work in a home-based environment. I had one come to me, a financial controller came to me and said, my server was in the basement and it was flooded. What can you do with it? So I asked him, you know, what's, what backups have we got in place? He said, oh, we've got these tapes we've been swapping out. So he gave me the tapes. We had a look at that to, to recover. And of course the server was flooded, so we had to go to another backup server. Um, unfortunately, what I found was none of those backups had been working for the last six months. Uh, what they had found was, um, there was there was a misconfiguration. So each time they put the tape in and left the office every night, um, the tape was being ejected without any data being stored to it. So they had to go back six months before they actually had a good backup and they had six months of data they then had to backfill. And of course, all of that data was on paper in the flooded uh, basement. So that meant a lot of difficulty for that organization. So I'd, again, reiterate, make sure, don't overlook it, make sure you've got appropriate backup policies in place and that you're testing it. And that comes into the next part, which is the culture of security. So this is this is a big part that can often be overlooked within organizations, is making sure that you're taking appropriate steps to inform, train, and have your users appreciate a culture of security within the environment. Um, it's no good, again, enforcing policies, like I said about the password policy, if users don't appreciate and they simply try to find shortcuts around it. So some of the steps in terms of that culture of security, make users aware, you know, phishing attacks are increasing. We, um, you know, we are generally prone to being compromised, uh, whether it's through an email asking us to verify our login details. Maybe, like I said, I've had emails coming in asking me to sign up for a new security training exercise that was going to be run from my organization. As it turned out, it wasn't my organization running this training exercise. It was somebody wanting me to log in on a different website with my uh, Netrix credentials so they could grab that information. So make sure that you verify the links that are coming in your emails. Make sure you understand, you know, where are those links taking you to? And is that an authorized site? Of course, you want to look at that. You want to verify the sender. Again, look at the domain name in a bit more detail. If it's misspelled, if it's slightly different, how many of us get emails from paypal.uk.com? You know, that's not a legitimate PayPal email address. But uh, again, it's been used, it's out there. Attackers have, have registered plenty of these um, to try and fool us and to trick us into clicking the links. Be wary of the attachments that are coming in from these, um, from these various emails and from who they claim to be from. Uh, you know, financial controllers are prone to this. They get attachments coming in apparently from the CEO asking them to organize, you know, payments, or an overnight pay run for a particular account. Uh, perhaps, you know, they, they put in that the business depends on this going through tonight. Um, we'll check those links. And again, check those recipients, uh, those senders, and check, you know, that attachment. Uh, make sure that you're not inadvertently clicking something that you shouldn't be clicking, um, especially if it's unexpected. And lastly, this is part of that previous step of having appropriate response plans and policies in place. Make sure that you have somewhere for users to report suspicious activities. When I got this training email in um, that, that could have compromised me, I wasn't the only one. In fact, um, one of my Microsoft Teams groups lit up with other users within my organization um, asking, is this legitimate? And of course, we had someone coming through from support to say, no, that's, that's not legitimate, we've identified a possible attack. Um, so let's have a look at that. Look at that within your organization. There's no need for additional expense. You simply have someone 
who is um, is going to be the controller. They're the one who's going to receive reports, and they can evaluate. You know, if we get an increase in reports around certain types of attacks, certain types of phishing emails, then they can make an announcement. Make sure that everyone's aware, so that everyone's more conscious. So on to Netrix, more specifically, what we can do to help within your organization. So for anyone who's not entirely familiar with Netrix, uh, we are a data security platform. So we're about visibility, we're about security, about understanding who can do what, um, and of course, who is doing what, and when and where within your environment. So using Netrix within your environment, you can uh, follow several of these steps that I've already recommended here around monitoring your VPNs, monitoring your network devices for VPN logins, for day-to-day -day usage and activity, understanding what's going on there. You can then highlight those spikes, you know, if there's a lot of traffic going on back and forth. Uh, perhaps we've got multiple failed login attempts coming into the VPN. Using Netrix Auditor to highlight those spikes in activity helps you again identify a possible vector of attack. Monitor activity within uh, your SharePoint and within your Azure AD. So again, looking at data access, data downloads, um, data being shared on the tenant within uh, within your SharePoint, or multiple failed login attempts coming in from Azure AD, or if you're using AD federated services, again, watching for those multiple logins to your Office 365 environment. Where are they coming from? Are they geographically in a location that is known as a safe location? Um, and you're expecting to see traffic coming from that part of your environment. And the last part there is knowing who's doing what with your sensitive data. So Netrix will go a step further, not just looking at your data, looking at your files and folders and your users and activities within your environment, but we can actually go and look at the data itself and help you to identify sensitive information. And sensitive information can mean different things to different companies. Like I said, this could be financial reports, this could be personal information from your HR folders. This could be customer information. It could be price books. It might be that you're running a business that's uh, in the food industry. So you've got various recipes that you want to secure. You can identify that data using Netrix data, data classification, and then we can make sure that you can target that data for um, monitoring for unusual activities, behaviors, trends, and spikes and similar. Once you understand your environment, you can then use Netrix to highlight and alert around different areas as well. Uh, brute force attacks, like I said, multiple logins within a short space of time, very easy to trigger an alert around that activity. Access to your critical servers. So again, monitoring your servers for access, taking an inventory of the software being installed. I've got customers who come to me saying, I've seen some unusual activities around AnyDesk or around TeamViewer or around LogMeIn. And this is where perhaps you've got administrators, they're just making sure that they can secure access to these parts of the environment, sensitive parts of the environment, because they're worried about if access gets cut off, will they still be able to do their job if they don't have access to the office buildings? So what's been good is that Netrix has been doing its job, notifying them of unauthorized software being installed, and it's also helped them to enforce their security policy, you know, security first, um, in terms of what software can be installed and, and how that's deployed. Catching privilege elevations is another important one. If you've got um, you know, groups within your organization that have access to sensitive data or have access to um, critical systems within your organization, make sure that you can notify for uh, any users that have been added to those groups like domain admins so that you know about changes taking place in those parts of the environment. Ransomware activity, very easy to detect again. When ransomware uh, gets going, what it does is it makes changes to files. Now it could be deleting the files, it could be encrypting them, but these are files being accessed and changed. So with our activity thresholds, Netrix can again highlight, we've got excessive access going on here. And Netrix doesn't just have to alert, you can also have proactive response uh, workflows where Netrix will actually kick off a script that's going to lock down that user account, or it's gonna change the file share to read only, so that uh, you can block that attack as soon as it's detected, rather than having to wait for someone to pick up the email and, and go in and manually make those changes. And finally, if you do suffer an attack, you suffer an incident, if a user has been compromised, 
then you need to know exactly what they did, where they did it, and uh, and which system was affected by that user. So that's where Netrix Auditor combined with data classification helps you to identify exactly what's taken place and where it's taken place. Netrix does this with, uh, with the two components within our platform. So you've got Auditor looking at your infrastructure, whether it's your um, uh, Active Directory or Azure AD servers, whether we're looking at your unstructured data on your file servers, or we could be talking about Exchange, SharePoint, and Office 365 data hosted on-premise or in the cloud. Metrics will look at these um, various endpoints, pull in the activity, as well as grabbing um, security inventories to look at permissions, access controls, stale data, stale users within your environment, helping you get a better grip on the governance within your organization. On top of that, we have data classification. That actually goes and looks at the content, as I said earlier, and helps you to identify sensitive data within your organization. Now, looking at this diagram, you can see there, Netrix Auditor looks at infrastructure. Netrix Data Classification overlaps there with your infrastructure. In addition, data classification can go further. We can actually look at your cloud-based data. So if you have spun up Dropbox for business, or you have spun up G Suite for your corporate Google Drive access, then Netrix Data Classification can help you to identify where is the sense of information in these cloud-based data stores. You know, who's got access to, to this data at the moment? Um, and, and is this data appropriately protected? Is it protected from being shared with external unauthorized sources as well? Netrix doesn't stop there neither. We have um, API integrations that allow us to talk to a wider variety of uh, tools and components as well. So if your organization has already made a considerable investment, perhaps in a help desk solution, in identity and access management controls, then Netrix can pull in the activities from these endpoints uh, so that you can use Netrix to report, to alert, and of course that data is also retained in our long-term archive. That means if you have an incident in your AWS, your Amazon Web Services, you're not limited to that 90-day restriction that AWS has on their cloud audit system. Rather, you can pull that data into Netrix, and you're gonna have that data for up to 10 years or longer depending on what retention cycles you want to save for your audit data. In addition to pulling information in, Netrix also will push data out to these uh, other solutions. So if you do have a help desk, if you have a seam solution with a dashboard and a SecOps team, you can make sure that Netrix is able to curate and highlight you know, unusual activities. And then when we trigger an alert, you can push that through so the appropriate teams are being notified. And even further, if you're using data classification, well, let's have a look at tagging data so that if you have sensitive data that has been identified as confidential for internal use only, then you can use Netrix to put that tag within the metadata properties. And that means if a user tries to share that information externally, your DLP or your CASB solutions are going to pick up those metadata tags and it's going to apply the appropriate handling rules. It's going to prevent those users from unauthorized sharing attempts. It's going to prevent those users from saving this data to unsecure local devices and similar there. Really what we're trying to do with Netrix here is make sure that your environment is appropriately protected and you don't need to go out and, and uh, you know, reinvent the wheel. If you've already made considerable investment in these areas, then Netrix is here to enhance those investments uh, with the data that we're able to give to you. So with that said, I'm going to jump into a brief demonstration of the platform and how it works. Netrix itself sits on an application server within your environment. So this could be on-premise or hosted in the cloud. And all we have is an audit database sitting behind Netrix to collect that data. Now, when it comes to setting up Netrix, it really is as simple as pick a data source. In my case, I can choose my Active Directory. And all I need to do is specify a data collection account. So this is an account that has permission to pull the data in from the source. And then we, what we're going to do is we're going to connect to that data source and start collecting audit data from the native event logs. Netrix is an agentless deployment. So that means when you're actually adding in your domain controllers, all we need to do is point it at the domain. And if I have an account that has appropriate permissions to talk to the DC, then we're going to have that data within 10 minutes from those event logs. There's no additional software 
to be deployed to those endpoints. There's no need to go and make significant changes to your environment. You really can pull Netrix down and have this data. Uh, you know, you can set this up in the morning. You could have set this up when I started talking today, and you would have data by now if you um, if you connected and started pulling in from these various sources. Once we're collecting that data from those data sources, you can then run different reports to see activities and what's going on within your environment. So if I look here over the last 30 days of activity within my environment, I can see exactly where all the changes have been made, what parts of my environment. I can see who's the most active users making those changes. And I can drill down into any one of these as well to quickly understand exactly what they're changing there. So in this case, Ms. Joplin has been removing some files on my file servers. I can see where she's editing files there, where the size of the file uh, is changing. I can see permission changes, new files being added, files being copied from one location to another or being moved from one location to another. Very quick, very easy and presented in a format that you don't necessarily have to be terribly technical to understand. In addition to monitoring for activities, Netrix also pulls in uh, state and time data. So these are snapshots that we take of the environment of a daily basis so we can help you to identify those passwords with um, you know, inappropriate policies in place where they might have a password that doesn't expire, an account with a password that's not uh, required. You might find you've got inactive user accounts, stale users that haven't authenticated with your server for some time. Well, let's go and have a look at those accounts. Let's maybe go and disable them. We can also look at areas around the files and the data itself. So I can look at files and folders that are accessible to everyone or accessible to the authenticated users group. Again, potentially overexposed data. I look at file and folder names that contain sensitive data. So again, all I have here is a simple blacklist of names I don't want to see. And in this instance, let's talk about password. I never want to see a file or folder called password within my environment. If I do, then I need to go and have a chat to that person and see why did you create it and then have a look at the audit data see and who's had access to it. These indicators as well, these risk level indicators are managed by yourselves. So there's no machine learning, nothing fancy going on behind here. You can establish your own baselines. If I talk about user accounts with passwords that don't expire, if I go and actually review that, I can see here I've got five accounts. I've got service accounts and I've got some administrator accounts that are set up. Now, if we were to make a change, we could um, uh, and maybe add another account, then what I could do is I could set my risk level to say, well, look, if I have six, or more, then I'm going to highlight that as a high level risk. And that means that risk level indicator would go from green to red, and I'd know this is an area of concern that I need to look at. So risk assessments, easy way to get a very quick understanding of potential risks within your organization. On top of this, we've got various reports available around activity within um, different parts of the environment, whether we're talking Active Directory, whether we're talking Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, or even on your file server. I've got activity reports around files being added, moved, changed, permission updates, elevations, and similar there. I can also go and look at the controls around you know, permissions, who's got access to this data. If I look at file and folder permission details, I can go and understand who's got access to my NetApp server right now, um, in particular, this data folder on my NetApp server, and I can see how they have access. So is it inherited through groups? Am I following that least privileged access model? Or in this case, I've got one user, Anton, who's been given direct access to that folder. So I might want to go and find the data owner and have a chat to them and see why has Anton got explicit access? Should they have access? To do so, I could just run a report here around potential data owners. And what that actually does is that looks at my NetApp folder and shows me the last 30 days of activity so I can see who's made the most changes and the most reads within that folder. In this case, it's G Gilmore, who was a member of, you know, they had inherited access to that group. So I can go and have a chat with G Gilmore and ask them, why does Anton have access to this folder, explicit access to this folder, and should we uh, make any amends to change that? On top of this, of course, you might not want to just look at activities. You might want to highlight activity trends, unusual behaviors, look at the blind spots within your organization. So that's where we have 
reports that are set up to look at activity surges, that we can look at um, unusual trends and behaviors. We can look at suspicious activity or potential user identity theft, you know, multiple logins from various endpoints within a short space of time. Very useful one is looking at privilege elevation. And this is what I was talking about earlier, where you could look at, um, you know, your domain admins perhaps, or your secure access group. If I just drop that name in there, and I can say, has anyone been given temporary access to these groups for less than 24 hours? So any users who were temporarily added um, into these groups and then taken out over the last 12 months. And very quickly, what I get back is I get a list of different users that have had access to that. And I can also see not only the user who was added to the group, but the administrator who put them in and who took them out. And I can see how long they existed in those groups as well. And I can take any one of these Let's pick on this one here. Sandy Woodward, back in August, was given access to uh, to this particular group. So what I can actually do within Natrix is I can go and search for activity. So I can say, show me everything Sandy Woodward did within my environment. And this searches everything. So SharePoint, on-premise, VPN usage, everything using this user's login credentials. And very quickly, we can see where Sandy's made lots of changes within my environment. Maybe I want to filter that out. Maybe I want to just see, you know, I don't want to see files being removed. I want to see any changes they made. And quickly I can see there where they've gone and changed a very conveniently named folder in my HR folders uh, around salary data. So where they've gone and they've gone and modified some data within that part of the environment. So searching helps you to very quickly get to the bottom of what you need. You can also create custom searches within Netrix to look at specific actions or activities that you want to alert on. So that's where we can come in and pick up on alerts on those unusual activities, um, such as you know brute force logins. So if I go and look at my login activity monitors, I've set up three here. So I'm looking at login activities and I'm actually capturing uh, information around logins and failed logins. So I've got a level one alert here. This is around a single failed login. All I'm looking at is a, a, a failed login within my environment. And I've set a very low threshold to say, if a user fails to log in three times within 30 seconds, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record a risk score of two points. So I'm gonna give them a risk score that will highlight in my behavior anomalies dashboard. But if I go back and have a look at my second level alert, I've got multiple failed logins and I've changed the thresholds here to say, no, actually, if they have five failed logins within 60 seconds, that seems a bit excessive now. That's not a user forgetting their password. That's somebody who's perhaps they're trying to guess a password or something similar. So again, I'm not notifying a recipient. I don't have a response action enabled, but I am applying a risk score of 10. So for three failed logins, it's two. For five failed logins, it's 10 points applied to their risk score. So that highlights that user as a higher risk. But then the third level, excessive failed logins, I've set this for 50 logins within five minutes. So that means if someone's trying to log in 10 times a minute over five minutes, that's probably a bot or that's probably some automated process. So in that case, I've got a risk score of 50, so a much higher level risk. I've also got a recipient set up, so I'm notifying the help desk that we've detected excessive login threats. And we could also have a response action there, so I could have a script kicking off here that's going to trigger another workflow perhaps to go and lock that user account or something similar. But that's where you can set up different logins and alerts, um, uh, sorry, login alerts to capture specific information and access attempts within your environment. And of course, those alerts end up contributing to risk scores here within your environment. So you can see over the last 30 days, I can see users that have uh, triggered the most alerts within my environment. So I can see straight away, my Netrix account has got a number of excessive logins um, or a number of excessive alerts. In fact, what I've got here is mass data reads on my file servers. So I've been triggering alerts around accessing a significant number of files in a short space of time. I might want to go and look at that in more detail. Actually, in this case, I'm gonna just pick on one user here who was logging in to one of my uh, sensitive servers earlier last month. And I can actually go and look at this user's detail, not only looking at their logins, but actually looking at their activity while they were logged in. So here's where I can see a user. 
they were making changes, uh, password changes to multiple users within my environment, I can actually go and jump into a session recording of that activity, of those actions that took place there. So Netflix does have the option to go beyond just auditing on log files. You can actually capture real-time activity um, and, and review that again as if it was happening in front of you. Uh, very handy for jump servers if you've got contractors coming in, if you've got um, you know servers that contain sensitive data, you can have these recordings so they only trigger when certain users log in. If they're not a member of your IT admins group, then you can have that alert triggered. Or you might say, I only want this alert triggered when someone opens up the database configuration window. So you can also specify that it's only for certain actions or activities that we're going to trigger those alerts there. And you can follow this through um, in the video format, or of course we could go back and we can actually review the, um, the activity itself in a log file format. So very much when it comes to remote access and securing your environment, Netrix is, is about getting that information in front of you quickly and easily so that you can understand exactly what's going on um, and, and you know what's been affected by it. For us at Netrix, it's very important to ensure that our customers experience a fast turnaround in terms of seeing a return on their investment with our product. We have, um, you know, we've, we've opened the product up to both integrate with multiple systems to make sure you can take advantage of existing implementations that you might have. We've also ensured that we're very transparent in the results. So I didn't go much into the data classification today, but very much we have um, uh, accurate data classification tools and workflows and rule sets. And uh, I'm only too happy to take you through that on a one-on-one -on -one if you're interested in going through that in a bit more detail. And finally, of course, Netrix ourselves, we are a trusted advisor in this area. We've been around for 14 years now. Um, within, within our own customer base, we receive high acclaim for our support, for our enablement, um, and we'd only be too happy to take you through that and specific use cases within your business sector or your business verticals as well, should you like to have a conversation further with us. So very much that's me wrapping up. Um, and just before we go into questions, if anyone has anything to ask there, I'd like to say that we, uh, we have a free trial, so you can download Netrix now to test in your own environment. In fact, we, uh, you can download executables or you can pull down a virtual appliance so you can spin that up in Hyper-V or VMware if you've got that in your environment. We also have browser-based demos, so you can go through and look at any of the information I've shown you today in a bit more detail, should you wish to. Um, or if you'd like to go through a one-on-one -on -one demo, if you'd actually like someone like myself to jump on a call with you and your security team, then I'm only too happy to go through that and answer any direct questions you might have there as well. But with that, thank you to everyone for joining us today and to uh, Rommel for setting this all up. Before we wrap up, uh, any questions that have come through there, we'll take some time now just to answer those too. So I just saw there um, one of the questions popping up there coming in. Um, so can we get AD logs like when a user logs in and logs out? Absolutely, so yes, Netrix will show you um, login activity uh, to, to see when a user's logged in um, and, and when they've, they've disconnected as well. Um, we pull the login data from Active Directory, Azure AD, and we also pull that information from um, uh, ADFS, Active Directory Federated Services. So again, looking at Office 365 information, of course, ADFS will only show the login, it won't actually show a logout. Um, in addition, you can also get login information from a single window server. So if users are using local logins on those single window servers, we can also pull that information there as well to grab both the login and the logout action uh, from the logs. So just seeing if there's any more questions coming through there. Looks like that's all we have there. So I'm going to wrap us up today. Um, I once again just want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. Um, thanks to Bulwark for inviting us to present. Um, and of course, 
if anyone uh, would like any more information, then do feel free to reach out to um, Rommel and the team at Bulwark. We're only too happy to take that offline um, and explore those options further with you. But from me and the team at Natrix, thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Dave. Uh, it, it was a very brief, uh, you know, a session and is clearly understand about the different, you know, possibilities and capabilities of Netflix. And uh, thank you for your time. And I just once again, thank you for the, all the people uh, who's attended the session. Thank you for your time. Uh, see you soon. And we will share uh, the complete details about the session. And uh, you can just acknowledge back uh, based on your different, you know, feedbacks. Thank you. Thank you, guys.